Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Umberto Tomorrow, and I'm the Deputy Director of Program at the Art Foundation in New York and guest curator for the exhibition Generalization by Tania Perez Cordova. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to the lecture Materiality and Optic Oriented Ontology by Graham Hammond. This lecture is both part of the public program for generalization, uh, Tanya's solo exhibition, which opens today to the public, and it is also presented as the eighth occurrence of the program Futuros Posibles or Possible Futures, a series of programs which, along with Jaime Ruiz, head of education here at Museo Tamayo, we initiated in 2019. Futuros Posibles is a series of multidisciplinary events which introduce discussions related to new metaphysics, such as speculative realism, new materialism, and so on, in relationship to contemporary art. Our guest today is Graham Harman. He currently works as Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the Southern California Institute of Architecture in Los Angeles. Among his recent books are Art and Objects and Architecture and Objects, and the forthcoming The Graham Harman Reader and Objects Untimely, Object-Related Philosophy and Archaeology in collaboration with Christopher Whitmore. A founding member of the Speculative Realism and Object-Oriented Ontology movements, he's also an editor of the Speculative Realism series in Edinburgh University Press, which is co-edited with Bruno Latour, as well as a new metaphysics series at Open Humanities Press, and editor-in-chief of the journal Open Philosophy. Since the 90s, Herman proposed the term object-oriented ontology, questioning the Western model philosophical tradition with new reflections such as those of Bruno Latour and Kentan Meliasso. Graham Herman has disseminated ontology-oriented, object-oriented ontology, also known as triple O or OOO, as a new philosophical approach related to the speculative realism movement, which gained traction in and around Goldsmiths University in London in 2007. For Harman, the relationship of objects, aesthetics, and aesthetics are important, since for him, objects can never be exhaustively known by any proposition or mathematics. Therefore, indirect knowledge and mediations are, that are more common in the arts are needed. Harman is a philosopher who has made considerable advances to make the speculative realism and object-oriented ontology movement accessible for a myriad of communities around the globe, and today's lecture is no exception. Coincidentally, Tania Perez Cordova studied her master's in fine arts at Goldsmiths a few years before the rise of speculative realism, and it's interesting how her work has evolved consistently ever since, parallel to the international widespread of this movement. What we're proposing with this entanglement is that Tanya, Tanya's work, which is by and about objects, can be read under the real and sensual qualities proposed by Graham Herman in the Triple O. We sincerely hope that Graham's vast vocabulary and powerful ideas he introduced with his lecture will resonate with you today. I want to also to take a moment to acknowledge the support of Fundación BBVA, as well as Caja Negra Editora in Argentina, who has supported this lecture. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Graham Harman. Thank you to everybody for coming. It is a thrill to be back in Mexico City. I was here once as a tourist in 1999, so it's been 23 years. And it's my first time ever speaking in this city, though I have actually been to Juan uh, four years ago. Um, I will also say that my biggest problem as a person is that I speak too fast. And I know that you all speak English well, but I'm going to try to speak uh, more slowly than usual to keep myself under control. Feel free to raise a hand if I get too excited and you know, speak again. So, materiality and object oriented ontology. Uh, many people see a similarity there, because after all, object oriented ontology talks about objects, including material objects like this and this, glass, insects, things like that. Nonetheless, object oriented ontology is not a materialism. 
the differences and the reasons why I think are philosophically very interesting. Um, there have been all kinds of materials throughout the history of philosophy. Uh, the first ones, of course, were in pre-Socratic philosophy, who said that uh, everything's made of water, everything's made of air, air, earth, fire, and water combined, joined by love, separated by hate, or everything's made of atoms, in the case of Eusebius and Democritus. And uh, what they are all effectively doing is reducing large and medium-sized objects to something small that is supposed to be the thing of which everything else is built. And that is very useful, of course, in the sciences and in other areas of life. The problem is it misses what we call emergence. So the fact that even if we all agreed that everything has a material basis, and I wouldn't agree, by the way, because I don't think there's a material basis for numbers or for things like justice or for good. I think those are specifically immaterial. And I think that's one of Plato's great discoveries. But let's say for a second that we all agree everything was made of material particles. Even if that were true, there are some things that happen when you put material particles together that you can't necessarily just call material. So the famous example is water, H2O. Water is made of hydrogen and oxygen, uh, and yet water is something different from those. And consider the fact that hydrogen and oxygen, fire burns both of them very easily, whereas H2O, water, uh, extinguishes fire. And so obviously the water does something, has certain capacities that its components do not. And then of course, even the hydrogen and oxygen atoms are made of smaller components, protons, and neutrons, and electrons. And ultimately, everything physical is made of, of quarks and electrons, since protons and neutrons are made of quarks. And then some people think they're made of tiny springs, and we don't know if there's any problem. We don't know if there is a final material layer. That remains speculative. But emergence, the fact that when you put material things together, you get larger things that have different properties, like this city, for example. Everything in the city, you could say, is material, including the people, the buildings, the trees. Uh, and yet, the city is somehow more than that, because the city can remain the same city even when changes are made. Um, you know, people move, people uh, move, move away, they move into the city, people die, people are born. Um, I'm sure the city has expanded greatly since I was last here 23 years ago, and yet, in some sense, it's still the same city. There's a certain style to the city. And even when you come here as a traveler, as I just did last night, you have to readjust yourself to the style of the city, and it changes you. There's a different rhythm of life, different things here that you do and don't do compared to Los Angeles, where I just came from. So you could say that Mexico City is a, it's an emergent whole. And these are the main reasons I don't think that kind of materialism works. Because the higher up you get, there are more and more complex entities. And you, even if you think that Mexico City could not exist without material objects, it doesn't mean that Mexico City is itself a material object. It's something built out of that that emerges. So that's the first kind of materialism I want to talk about. The second kind is the kind known in the Enlightenment period, which was useful as a way of debunking superstition and challenging the excessive authority of religion in that period. And so it was a way of um, freeing, supposedly freeing people from oppressive beliefs, beliefs in things that are immaterial and therefore don't exist, such as ghosts or black cats walking, walking in front of you, being bad luck, this kind of thing. And again, that may be useful. It may help to get rid of uh, things that are superstitions and therefore oppressive that we shouldn't believe. And yet there may be things not accounted for by the current scientific worldview, but are nonetheless true. And so sometimes an excessive version of the Enlightenment approach is, uh, can be harmful, even though we are used to thinking that it's always good. There may, there may well be paranormal phenomena uh, that we should keep an open mind about, for example. We just don't know. Um, so it's okay to be skeptical about those things, but not to dismiss them outright. And then, of course, there's the Marxist version of materialism, which is designed to combat ideology um, and to replace considerations of religion and culture and other such things 
with a, an unsentimental look at the material conditions of production uh, that define the way society really works. So that's another form of, of materialism. And so for all these reasons, materialism has uh, gained a great deal of political prestige on the left, and also a great deal of intellectual prestige among those who feel especially devoted to the natural sciences. And a, a belief has sprung up that uh, to believe in anything beyond the material is somehow reactionary and should therefore be avoided. Now, um, I want to say something positive about materialism, though. I want to say something about the new materialists, a group of thinkers who have become one of the leading uh, schools of philosophy in the 21st century, the main authors of all women, of course. And I'm speaking about people like Karen Barat, Jane Bennett, Rosie Berdani, uh, Sarah Ahmed, Claire Colebrook, the list goes on. There's some men involved too, uh, such as Thomas Mayo, the younger American philosopher working in Denver, who's very much uh, right in the middle of the materialist movement. Sometimes Manuel Zanda, your, your countryman who's been living in New York for many years, he's moving back to Mexico soon, by the way, moving to close to Cuernavaca. Um, so I hope you get to invite him here sometime too. He's a wonderful speaker. Uh, and also Quentin Meassou in France. These are also materialists. I wouldn't call them new materialists for a reason I'll explain in a minute. But the, uh, the new materialists are doing very interesting things, and primarily their value, I think, is helping us recover from the 1980s and 1990s in continental philosophy, continental theory, where everything was either about language or power, in some sense. And we learned a lot from that period, right? We learned a great deal from figures like Derrida or Foucault. And yet what is missing from Derrida or Foucault is much sense of the non-human world. So in, in Derrida, you're focusing primarily on texts, on the double or triple meanings of words, on the impossibility of saying something even while you're saying it, and, and so forth. Whereas with Foucault, what we get a sense of is the disciplinary apparatus, the way that power works in an invisible way, permeating all of our actions. Um, and of course, these are important lessons. And you do get some material objects in Foucault, but they are primarily material objects shaped by the human cogito as historically defined. So you don't really get a strong sense of, of the, even though Foucault is sometimes called a materialist and he's an influence on materialism and historicism, <laughs> he's not really a fan of inanimate objects uh, in the way that you start to get with someone like Bruno Latour. Bruno Latour, my favorite living philosopher, who I would call a kind of uh, fellow traveler of the materialists rather than the materialists. But what Latour is most known for is trying to break down the modern uh, duality between thought on one side and the world on the other, as if those were the only two things that exist. We find this in Descartes, right? Other than God, who's an infinite substance, Descartes believes there are two finite substances, thought and physical extension. Those are the two. And God is needed for communication between these two, since they are so different. So to move my arm, which is a body, I need God to bridge the gap between my thoughts and my arm. Uh, what Latour allows us to see through in that is the notion that you can't always really separate those. That for, for Latour, a lot of objects are hybrids, and ultimately for Latour, all objects are hybrids. So this is a physical object, obviously, but it's also shaped by human chemistry, making the plastic out of petroleum products. And of course, it's inscribed with branding and, and uh, commercial discourse. And so you would never really say this is either thought or world. It's, it's a hybrid made of both. The two mutually shape each other. And for the Torah, all objects ultimately are that. Um, I think there's also a problem with the Torah's uh, breakthrough, which I will discuss in a moment. So it's at least a good first step to say that you can't really separate thought and the world in, in the way that it's been done during the modern period. And back to the materialists. Um, object oriented ontology is sometimes wrongly taken to be a form of materialism or new materialism, as I mentioned. Uh, Thomas Lemke, the German scholar, wrote a very critical book about the new materialists. The first chapter is about me, and I'm not really a new materialist. So even someone who's an expert, a critical expert in new materialists like Lemke, mistakenly put me as the first chapter of this book. It's actually kind of a rude chapter. Contains a lot of personal insults about how I'm a bad person. 
because I haven't talked about things that are important to him. Um, you get a lot of this. You, like, you know you're looking at a bad critique when critique basically says this author is a bad person. I mean, hi, there's, there's someone who was a bad person, but uh, still a great philosopher. Uh, but a book that just said Heidegger was a bad person, he was a Nazi, we should read his books. That's not very critique of Heidegger, right? Uh, you have to recognize that despite Heidegger's problems, both politically and personally, uh, he, he gave us some thoughts that we cannot unthink. He wrote some things that we cannot unsee, and we have to address them on that level. It's not enough just to call him a Nazi. Um, it's not enough, uh, another critic I responded to in the spring, said object oriented ontology is evil because it uses the word object and slaves were treated as objects rather than as people. Therefore, object oriented ontology is complicit in slavery in some way for using the word object. It's a, it's a bad objection. The word object has been around for a long time. Um, you can't say object oriented ontology is pro slavery. That's simply not true. You need to get you need to get an, an objection is at the same level at which object oriented ontology is posed. So try not to argue against people by saying they're bad people. It's not nice, but it's also not effective intellectually. Um, so, anyway, uh, the new materials, let me go through. I, I said one thing that I think is good about the new materials. They helped us get past the, the dominance of Derrida and Foucault in common philosophy, which when I was in graduate school, I started in 1990, you pretty much had to work on either Derrida or Foucault to be taken seriously. You could do Heidegger, but that was kind of old fashioned. Also, it's kind of old fashioned. Deleuze wasn't really on the map as an important philosopher yet. He was there, but he was treated as almost a kind of entertaining comical figure who was making a lot of jokes, kind of like Jean Baudrillard. In fact, the first class I took in graduate school was Deleuze and Baudrillard. It was treated as, as kind of a fun class. These two irreverent French guys who are making fun of everything. They, they weren't treated as deeply serious philosophers in the way to call the period. Well, that changed in about 1994, 95, I first started noticing. Maybe a little bit earlier in the United Kingdom, maybe a little bit earlier in architecture. The United States, about 1995, I don't know about Latin America. Probably right around then. Anyway, the, the new materials are heavily under Deleuzean influence in most cases. And let me go through a couple of them and talk about uh, what I worry about to each of them. And I'm going to start with Jane Bennett, who's maybe my favorite of the new materialists. And when you read Jane Bennett or read my books, you're going to find a lot in common. And Jane Bennett, of course, is also a wonderful writer. It's a pleasure to read her works such as Vibrant Matter, which I strongly recommend to those who have not read it. And then Jane Bennett also wrote an article responding to me and Timothy Morton in an issue of the journal New Literary History. It's a journal for literary critics. And Jane Bennett's critique of objects in that article was to say that objects are just temporary swirls in a, in a cosmic hole. She calls it a throbbing hole. So there's this universal hole that's kind of vibrating, and the things we call objects are um, just transient crystallizations within that hole. And I find a lot of this in Deleuze as well. I don't really find Deleuze to be a philosopher of objects, although Arjen Klein Herrenbrink, the Dutch philosopher, makes the contrary case, and he wrote a very good book about that. But uh, in Bennett's case, there's this idea that individual entities are somehow derivative. They're not real in the same way that flows and processes and the whole of the universe is real. This is a kind of monism we call it in philosophy, the idea that everything is really one, and the differences we see are not really there, or they're somehow secondary to the unity of all things. And I find a couple of problems with this. Uh, one of the problems with this is you have to ask, if everything's just one, then why does it seem like there are many different things? And this is a problem that faced the pre-Socratics already. Uh, Parmenides has the same problem. As Parmenides says, reason tells us that everything is one, the senses tell us that everything is many. So then the question will be, how do you get from that one in reality to the many of the senses? How, why is this illusion generated in the first place? If everything is one, why doesn't it just look one? And the answer for most philosophers, and this includes Laurent Baxon and the young Emmanuel Levinas, and to some extent even Heidegger, the answer, or Anaxagoras, 
in, in ancient Greek philosophy, the idea is usually something like that the human mind produces these illusions of individual things. That if we use our reason, we will see that everything is one. But there's an obvious problem there, because if it's the human mind that makes everything look like many, well, you, then the human mind must already be different from the one, right? Or else it couldn't generate this illusion of manyness. So you already have at least two. You already have at least the one of reality and then the human mind creating illusions out of that. So you've already contradicted the idea that everything is one. You've got the one and you've got the minds. Where did this mind come from? The problem that all these philosophies cannot solve. And uh, I think the only way to solve this is by uh, deducing that reality was already broken into pieces from the start. It was already going to be different things. Now certainly, we humans can be wrong about what those pieces are. We can think certain things are many when they're actually one, or that they're one when they're actually many. And a large part of human thought is devoted to figuring out uh, which is which. But you cannot just say that the fact of having many things in the world is a, a human illusion stemming from our minds. So that's my objection to Bennett's form of materialism. We need a certain plurality. For me, Roger Gurney's ontology, as for Aristotle, an ancient philosopher, but one who started a very great trend of the philosophy of individual objects. Uh, the world is plural, it's made of individual things. So that's the first thing I want to say about immaterialism. The second has, comes from Karen Graz, uh, who wrote uh, Meeting the Universe Halfway, one of the best uh, philosophy or theory books of the 21st century, published in, I think, 2008. That's another book I strongly recommend. It's probably, I'm sure it's in Spanish translation by now, just like Ben's book probably is. And Barat has the advantage that she was a professor of physics for quite a while before she got into philosophy. So she knows what she's talking about when she talks about science. And uh, Barat says, much like Niels Bohr, her hero, Niels Bohr, the great quantum theorist, that you can't really say that there's a world independent of thought or thought independent of the world, but that reality is constructed by our measuring apparatuses. So that when you measure light, you are constituting it as a wave or a particle by measuring it for the first time. It's basic quantum theory that she brings into philosophy. And it, so you can't really say, quote famously, that light is a wave or a particle until you, until you measure what it's doing. All right? And this is why her title is Meeting the Universe Halfway. In other words, you can't say everything is constructed by the mind, and you can't say that everything is just physical facts, that somehow reality is produced out of the interaction of these. Uh, and then she says that there isn't, in a way, reality is just created out of nothingness by the interaction of these two things. So they don't pre exist their interaction. It's not like there's a mind here and a physical world here, and then they come together and produce something different. So they are actually produced for the first time through their meeting, which is already fairly paradoxical. How can two things be produced by their meeting instead of pre existing that meeting? I would, I would take the more realist view that two things do pre-exist and can transform each other through meaning, but not that they can create each other ex nihilo. An example of this, from a quantum theory example, is that people often draw idealist consequences from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, right? Which says, for instance, that you, you can't measure both the position and the momentum of a particle simultaneously with total accuracy. You try to measure the position of complete accuracy, for complete accuracy, you cannot measure the momentum, which means the speed plus the direction. And if you try to measure the momentum with perfect accuracy, you can no longer know the position of the particle. And so some people draw the radical conclusion that therefore everything is created by the mind. It becomes a kind of mysticism. Well, the problem with that is that for Heisenberg, it's only the position and the momentum that are created by the measurement. It's not the particle that's created by the measurements. Particle does pre exist its measurement. It's just that the Heisenberg decides that its uh, position and momentum are relational properties. They only become real when something measures that particle. He doesn't say that the particle doesn't exist until it's measured. And I think Barat um, uh, probably goes a step too far in that direction. She adopts Bohr and Heisenberg as her model and says that. Um, Heisenberg said you can't measure both the position and the momentum. Bohr went further and said it doesn't have a position or a momentum until it measured. 
even if Bohr is right about that, I don't think he would say the particle isn't there until it's measured. Right? There's something there. It may not be a particle or a wave until you measure it, but there's something there that pre exists any of those forms that it takes on in the measurement. And here's my bigger objection to Baraka, which he says, meet the universe halfway. That sounds like a wonderful compromise and a very innovative step forward. But why is it the thoughts and worlds that have to be halfway? It looks like you're making a step past Cartesian dualism, right? Because you're not saying there's thoughts and then there's the world. It's, she's saying it's somewhere in between those two. All right, but when you say that, you're still taking those two as your starting point. You're still saying there's thought over here and then there's the world over here. And then we have to somehow meet between those two. So essentially, Barat remains in some way trapped in the central assumption of modern philosophy, which is that there are two basic kinds of things, and only two basic kinds of things. I call this ontotaxonomy. It's a word modeled after ontotheology, a term used by Heidegger and Derrida to critique traditional metaphysics. Ontotaxonomy is the dominant idea of modern philosophy, and it means there are just two kinds of things. One, human thought, and two, everything else. And think about how implausible this is at first glance. Humans are one small endangered species on one tiny planet near a fairly mediocre star in a mid-sized galaxy, and thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope, we're seeing how many galaxies are out there. So the universe is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. We are pretty tiny in cosmic terms. We're important to ourselves. I wouldn't join Ray Brassier in saying humans are worthless or anything like that. I think humans are, are, are great and so like, but we're still very small compared to the universe. So the idea that we deserve half the philosophy it is fairly implausible on the surface. Now, modern philosophers aren't stupid, right? They realize that. The reason they get human thought out of philosophy is a pretty good one, which is that everything we know about the universe comes through thoughts, and therefore thought must be our starting point. Um, and that's where the idealism of modern philosophy comes from. The idea that we can't, we can't get a reality directly, we have to pass through thoughts, and this is what thoughts uh, gets half of reality. I still think that's a bad idea. Um, maybe we'll come back to that reason later. Um, and the reason is this. Where are object-object relations in modern philosophy? Nowhere. Essentially, in modern philosophy, we say object-object interactions, let the scientists talk about that. They're doing a great job. Scientists are having a lot of success. That's a scientific question. Scientists can just measure what happens when two things smash together. Let them do it. We philosophers have to talk about the single relation between thought and worlds. That's all we do anymore. The, the thought-world relation is a special relation, different in kind from any other relation in the universe. That is where object-oriented ontology says no. The thought-world relation is just another kind of relation. The rules that govern the thought-world relation must be the same as the rules that govern the relation between cotton and fire. I talk a lot about fire burning cotton in my books because I got that example from classical Islamic philosophy. They often use that as the example. I was in Cairo for 16 years, became fairly well versed in Islamic philosophy, and it uh, influenced me a lot. And that's a problem they, they discuss a lot, is what happens when fire burns cotton. The more radical ones said, said that fire doesn't burn cotton, God burns cotton. It just looks like fire is burning cotton. And I'll get back to that shortly. You don't have to accept that version of the theory to find something useful in it. But object-object uh, -object relations are really missing from philosophy. Um, and the only real exception to that in the 20th century was Alfred Norman Whitehead. Um, and here's the best proof of Whitehead's uniqueness. He has his readership, but for the most part, he is not taken seriously as a major thinker by either of the two main camps of philosophy today, the analytic and the continental. Uh, the analytic and the continental traditions are both fairly well grounded in Immanuel Kant's philosophy, this transcendental position of Kant's philosophy, that the thought world relation is what we're presented with, and we can't really talk directly about anything beyond that. It, and that's what other science do, as the analytic philosophers usually do. In the case of continental philosophers, you, you usually say instead, oh, science is not primary. We have to do a phenomenological description of the world before we do science. So they have, both have different ways of, of dealing with science, but 
treating philosophy as though it has to be transcendental. It has to be in some way primarily about the thought world relationship. Whitehead doesn't fit. Whitehead says in his great book, The Process of Reality, that uh, the, the work, relation between human thought and the world is just another kind of relation. And that all relations need to be seen uh, in the same terms. And of course, the Rosians have shown an appreciation for Whitehead, such as Isabel Stingers, for instance. But in doing so, I think they're misunderstanding a central aspect of Whitehead, uh, one that we might come to in a few minutes. So that's my second objection to the materialism, that it doesn't really go at the central problem of modern philosophy, which is onto taxonomy. The idea that there's human thoughts and then there's everything else. That those are the two kinds of things that exist. I've got three more objections. Uh, number three comes from Bruno Latour. Bruno Latour wrote a brilliant four page article that's not very much read. It's called Can We Get Our Materialism Back, Please? And Latour talks in there about how, for a certain period of time in modern history, materialism was a discussion closing argument. Just pounding the table and saying everything's made of matter was a way to make people shut up, and make them look reactionary. And Latour says this is a bad idea for a very good reason. Materialists, in one sense, material is supposed to be something resistant and unknowable, something that our thoughts can't fully penetrate. This is one aspect of matter. Uh, we find that in Aristotle, for example, the fact that matter can't really be known, it always has a form. But that, what's happened in modern materialism is that materialism has been replaced by our knowledge of materialism. So not only are people saying there's material out there, it's something different from our thoughts, they're also tending to say that our thought can completely know it in an exhaustive way. So not only can I say everything's made of material particles, I can tell you exactly what those material particles are. I can give you equations that perfectly describe their behavior in space time. I can tell you exactly what the mass of a proton is. Um, I can tell you everything there is to know about matter, and if I can't tell you everything, well, just wait for a few more experiments or another 100 years of scientific progress, and then we will know. So matter always becomes, in the end, a gesture of knowledge against ignorance, whereas philosophy is actually a practice of ignorance, more than of knowledge. Just think back to Socrates. Socrates saying, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. I have never been anyone's teacher. Simply pull things out of them the way a midwife pulls out a baby from another body. But also, fiat in Greek doesn't mean wisdom, of course, it means love of wisdom. And so, Socrates is anything but a man of knowledge. Socrates is not a scientist, someone who is supposed to be getting us knowledge. Nor is he a sophist, someone who already claims to know the truth and claims to know that the truth is that there is no truth, everything's just a polystory. None of that is Socrates. Socrates is someone who's not sure what he knows or doesn't know about him. And yes, he always asks in Plato's dialogues about definitions of words, but you might remember Socrates never reaches any definitions of words. At the end of every dialogue, he's always puzzled. They might know better what friendship is than they knew at the beginning of the dialogue, but they don't know perfectly. And at his deathbed, Socrates speaks quite negatively of physical knowledge of the universe. He's quite clear that he thinks it is not enough. So um, the Taurus point is that matter usually simply strips away the fact that we remain ignorant of what the world is. And in the Taurus case, this is especially important politically, because one of the there are a couple of, of features of the Taurus politics that make, make it unique. One of them is that he thinks we can never know the political truth. Every political decision is a kind of temporary compromise between all the stakeholders, one that can be changed in the future based on new alliances and new knowledge. The other thing that's very unique, or relatively unique, about the tourist politics is his insistence that inanimate objects be taken seriously in politics. Jane Bennett also joins in this. If you look at modern political theory, which comes in two basic flavors, left and right, and what they boil down to is a disagreement about human nature. Are humans naturally good and sweet and sharing, or are humans naturally corrupt and violent and aggressive? If you believe the first, you're likely to side with Rousseau and Marx and think that we are good, we can have nice things politically, except that society corrupts us or that the 
working class is oppressed by those who control the means of production. And so therefore, we just need to fix society. We need to fix the way society is organized to gain a happy social system. Whereas on the right, you find a commitment to a permanent, dangerous human nature so that we have to use force, that people will naturally try to gain at the expense of others, that um, people will naturally lie if it's in their best interest to do so, that um, politics, as Carl Schmidt believes, is a struggle with the enemy, to defeat the enemy and preserve one's own way of life, and so forth. These are left and right, so they're polar opposites, and yet they share one assumption in common, which is that human nature is the basis for political theory. And then some of you may, read, may have read the recent fascinating book by the late David Graeber and David Wingro, uh, The Dawn of Everything, which starts by making the exact same critique I just made. It starts by criticizing those who follow Rousseau and those who follow Hobbes as the two opposites. And the criticism is that Rousseau thinks humans are naturally good, Hobbes thinks humans are naturally evil. And Gregor Wingro's counter argument is that humans aren't really naturally good or evil, humans are naturally creative. And they find evidence in archaeology and history for the fact that humans constantly recreate their own political units. And so therefore, we should be imaginative today, too. We shouldn't assume that liberalism and capitalism are the only options. We should inventively think of new forms of political organization. Now, it's a refreshing book, and I, I learned a lot from it, and I'm sure any reader will. The problem with it, as I see, is that you'll see they're again giving just another theory of human nature. They're not saying humans are naturally good or naturally evil, they're saying humans are naturally imaginative. And so, the sky is the limit. We just need to free our imagination. And this has been an increasing tendency of the political left, I've noticed. This started with my late friend Mark Fisher, in capital, capitalist realism, uh, capitalist realism, which Fisher defines as the idea that there's no alternative to capitalism, that there's no, no alternative can be imagined. In the words of Frederick Jameson, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And he's right in a way. It becomes very hard to imagine political alternatives to what we have. And then there was a recent article by Catherine Malibu that made much the same point, which is that the way to become politically imaginative is to act as if the world meant nothing, and politics was all a matter of organizing the human collective using our imagination. And that, I think, is simply not true. Um, even Marxism was well aware that you have to be aware of the, the genuine con material conditions of production right now. I think this is one of Marx's strengths as a thinker, uh, the fact that you have to be aware of the actual situation. You can't just imagine something into existence. And this is a place where I find the tour and that helpful because they're talking about the role that uh, non-human things play in organizing our society. <coughs> in particular, there's a wonderful article co-authored by the tour and Shirley Strong, who's a primate expert at the University of California in San Diego. She studies baboons. And she took the tour on one of her expeditions to study baboons. And what there are what they noticed in that article is that baboons are actually even more social than humans are. Baboons are always watching each other, uh, worried that the political order has changed somehow. Is this baboon massaging the other baboon's back? Which baboon is giving food to another baboon? And the baboons are afraid to go too far away from the other baboons. If the, if the other baboons start leaving, this baboon will follow them, even if he has some really good food here that he wants to eat. They're really afraid to be away from the others. Humans are not quite like this. Um, when you wake up in the morning, you know a lot about who you are, and it's generally pretty stable. You know your name, you know your government identification number, you know your job, you know your citizenship, you know your marital status, you know how much money you have in the bank, if any, uh, you know how much debt you have, if any. Uh, only in rare periods of crisis in our lives do we really wonder who we are. Especially the older you get, and you have more history behind you. You have this. I was just introduced by a list of credentials, right? The books that I wrote. The, you know, th those are my job at Southern California Institute of Architecture. Those are recorded public facts that the public will recognize. My PhD doctorate, which allows me to teach at a university. 
things of this sort. And these are all inanimate objects. Um, Renzio Ferraris, the Italian philosopher, says that it really boils down to documents. The human society is stabilized by documents, uh, by you know, marriage certificates and birth certificates and death certificates and constitutions. And uh, we would just be naked people standing in a field picking fruit from trees, if not for documents. It would stabilize our societies and assign people to certain roles, to give them certain privileges and certain duties and certain limitations. Incidentally, one of the funniest things about Ferraris is this has made him a hero to the nosaries in Italy. Uh, because they now have the most important profession in society. So when I was in Torino visiting Ferraris, uh, he invited me to this expensive dinner that was being hosted for him by the nobodies of Italy, fine wine. And, um, so yeah, he's, he's, he's the saint, Saint Maurizio, the, the Italian nobodies, because he's written very proud of the book about it. Uh, he calls himself the Marks of the Notaries. Anyway, uh, um, so that's another one thing. Another, another thing, another way in which non-human objects have played a huge role in human history is with geography, right? That who your country's neighbors are plays a huge role in your country's history. Where the mountains are, where the seas are, I mean, why does, why does England never worry about invasion? Because they're very hard to invade. Right? It hasn't happened since 1066. Napoleon couldn't do it, Hitler couldn't do it, the Spanish Armada couldn't do it. And so historically, the British have always had a large navy and a relatively small army. And that's because of a non-human fact, a geographical fact that there's a channel. And you can't really, an invasion force can't really go across the channel, especially since the invasion of aircraft that can bomb those ships. So this you know, British history is very much shaped by the fact that uh, they're relatively safe from an invasion. And you could say that for any country. Uh, what are the geographical factors and the factors involving their neighbors uh, that make life easier or more difficult for them? If you go to Eastern Europe, especially to a place like Poland, you're going to find a very serious geopolitical attitude that's also somewhat dark. And you can imagine why. The Polish at one point had Hitler and Stalin as their two neighbors to east and west, and that was not a good situation for the Poles. It worked out very badly for them. And so you have these very kinds of dark geopolitical discussions over there about the terms and things. And whereas a Caribbean island, you're not going to find that because they're not living under that kind of effect. They have other problems. Now, the problem with geography, of course, is that it's often, and this is why um, uh, Ray Ray Ringo don't like talking about it much, it's because geography tends to be associated with right wing politics. So the political right likes to think of political things as eternal facts, just facts of nature. And of course, the left doesn't like this. The left likes to think of society as something that can be reimagined and transformed, and therefore geography seems to be like a, a negative piece of evidence against that. My answer to this would be geography is like technology in a sense. That geography and technology both have opposite uh, priorities. They can be used for different things. Uh, this is an issue that pops up a lot in philosophy, I think. Um, very often, the most interesting philosophies or the most interesting theories, you can recognize them because they are criticized simultaneously for opposite reasons. People sometimes say, everyone's criticizing me. I must be doing something right. Well, that's not really true. Sometimes people are criticized just because everything they're doing is stupid, right? And nobody likes what they're doing. But if somebody's being criticized from both sides simultaneously, it's probably because they are doing something right. So Bruno Latour, for instance. In the United States, Bruno Latour is criticized for being this radical social constructionist who doesn't think there's reality outside the lines. But then in France, French sociologists critique Latour for being a reactionary realist who doesn't think society can shape reality. Neither of those is true, but it tells you something interesting, which is that Latour fits in neither of those categories. Right? He's neither a scientific realist nor a social constructionist. And this is why both of those sides have a hard time understanding him. Well, I would say the same thing about geography. In the case of the United States, for instance, there have been two political critiques of the United States over history, and they're opposites. Right? The recent critique of the United States, of course, is the United States is an imperialist bully and is going around bombing everybody and invading everybody and controlling different parts of the world. And you know, there's, there's a fair degree of merit in that critique. 
But that forgets that the earlier critique prior to World War I was that the United States never gets involved in anything. They want to live in their perfect little society and never get involved in European affairs, even when it would, it would suit them to do so. And so it's a long-term trend that you see the United States over centuries split between isolationism and interventionism. And there is a common link to those. And that common link is, I would say, moralism. You're always going to find a very strongly moralistic element in US foreign policy. It's either, oh, we have this great country here, European countries are all corrupt and they're all about power struggles, let's ignore them. That was the earlier attitude. Or it's the rest of the world is corrupt and they're attacking each other and they need us to save them. Another moralistic attitude. But the moralism stays the same. The moralism just expresses itself in opposite ways. Or one of my favorite historical examples is the Scandinavians. Because I ask you today what are your thoughts about the Scandinavians? Probably the majority of people say something like, Scandinavian society is very tolerant, they have a very generous welfare state, they have a lot of gender equality, they're nice to asylum seekers. We tend to think good things about the Scandinavian countries. Okay, but now let's go back 1,200 years. And I ask you what you think about the Scandinavians. Well, they're attacking monasteries, they're raping nuns, they're burning paintings, they're stealing everybody else's money, they're carrying people off into slavery. Well, um, one way you could deal with that is by saying there's no such thing as Scandinavian, there's just individuals, and the individuals now are different from before. I would say that's probably not true, right? That there are probably many elements of Scandinavian culture that have stayed the same. Uh, from the medieval period up till now. It's just that you can't describe what is Scandinavian in terms of such superficial qualities as generous or um, lacked, just as you can't probably describe the history of American politics as either isolationist or interventionist. Uh, it manifests itself differently at different times, but there's most likely something under there that's recognizable. Just like if you know a friend who um, maybe grew up in a very strict Christian household and then eventually became a vehement atheist, um, even though their surface beliefs are now polar opposite of the original one, you're going to find certain similarities. You're going to find possibly a certain dogmatism in their atheism that resembles the dog dogmatism of their Christianity when they were younger. Or look at St. Paul in Christian history. The uh, obsessive persecutor of the Christians became the most obsessive Christian. But there's something about St. Paul's personality that endures through, through those changes. So anyway, um, um, I mentioned that on the point of geography, because I don't think you can say that thinking about the role of geography in history is inherently a right wing point. It has uh, different polar possibilities. Okay, now my last two points about unitarianism. Uh, one of them is, I think, a flaw in Latour himself. And even though Latour is not really literally a materialist, he has some things in common. And that is the, the, with them, and that primarily that they all think that relation, looking at the world in terms of relations is better than looking at the world in terms of isolated things. This is not always true. Um, and again, let me start with the political point here. I was living in Egypt during the Egyptian Revolution, during the Arab Spring, and there were some criticisms at the time that object-oriented ontology can't really account for the Egyptian Revolution because revolutions happen through relations between people. Since object-oriented ontology wants to look at the non-relational character of objects, objects as they are themselves, it can't really lead to a good sort of politics. Well, the problem with that is if your politics is completely relational, then you can never ask for any sort of change in politics. Because for instance, if, if everything is relational, then the Egyptian citizens have to be defined by their relations to the Mubarak regime. They are the product of that regime, and therefore they should feel grateful for the social context in which they grew up, and they should preserve and cherish it. Uh, the only way you can really demand a change in government is if you have something in you, some human dignity or potential, that is being oppressed by the relations that are currently active, but somehow not freed up or liberated by the current uh, situation. So you're, if, if you're calling for a change in a situation, you're appealing to something that is not adequately expressed or free in that situation. 
So I don't think uh, relations are inherently politicated any more progressive than the kind relations. But the real problem for me is, is ontological, philosophical. And that problem is, for the tour, a thing is real insofar as it affects other things. So this table is real because it's weighing on the floor and it's supporting these objects. I am real because I'm talking to you. Um, Mickey Mouse is real because people are watching Mickey Mouse cartoons. This is the tour's definition of reality. It's to be real is to affect other things. So things reciprocate, sorry, reciprocally interrelate, and this is what makes them real. The problem here is if everything was nothing more than what it's doing right now, which is what the tour implies, why would anything ever change into a different situation? So in other words, if I am nothing more than my actions right now, how can I ever leave this room? How can I ever stop giving this talk? How can I fly back to Los Angeles on Monday if I am nothing more than the person who is actively speaking to all of you in Mexico City, as it is my life right now? And the answer is there's no way. There is no real way for the tour to talk about counterfactual situations or even to talk about the future. The tour's after network theory is much better at talking about things that have already happened. And this critique was made uh, over 2,000 years ago by Aristotle in the Metaphysics when he was arguing with a group called the Megarians. The Megarians are ancient versions of Bruno Latour because the Megarians said, uh, no one is a house builder unless they're building a house right now. You, you are only what you are actively doing this very moment. And Aristotle noticed the problem with this because, all right, I can try to build a house right now and I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no construction experience, but I will be a house builder according to me. What about a master house builder, a master construction worker who is asleep right now or who is taking a lunch break? According to the Megarians, they are not really a builder. You're only a builder if you're building. And this is what led Aristotle to introduce his famous concept of potentiality, meaning a real thing that is not currently expressed but can be expressed. And there are problems with Aristotle's theory of potentiality. I agree with Deleuze about this. I agree that virtuality would be better than potentiality. It's at least an important step towards realizing that not everything is expressed about a thing in any given moment. And I'll give you a concrete, I'll give you two concrete examples. First was my brother in his first year of university. He was failing all his classes. My parents were very angry. And they asked him, why, why aren't you studying? Why aren't you working harder? Why aren't you doing better at university? My brother's response was brilliant. He said, I'm a genius in a field that hasn't been invented yet. Great response, my parents weren't satisfied. But um, three years later, the World Wide Web was invented, and my brother, I don't know if he's a genius at it, but he became very successful at it. He ended up running Barack Obama's iPhone campaign and setting up uh, websites for major companies, so he's made a career at it. He couldn't have done that before 1994, when he was a student, because there was no World Wide Web. Could you say that he had the potential somehow to do it? I would say yes. I would say he was a potential web expert, even though no web ever existed. Here's another one that I find fascinating. Imagine there's something like a bus crash or a fire or a flood. Some people really panic. Other people become heroes and rescue other people. This is known from every disaster. Some psychologists ask, how can we guess who is going to panic and who is going to be the hero? in any situation. Which psychological traits in a person allow us to predict? And after a long study, the conclusion was nothing. It is completely unpredictable. Uh, friendly people are no more likely to be heroes than unfriendly people. Uh, um, aggressive people, no more likely than shy people. Physically strong people are no more likely to be heroes than physically weak people. Men and women, no difference. Each of us has potential heroism in us or potential panic in us if we are ever in a disaster. And we have no way to know until we're in it. That was the result of this study. And I find it fascinating that each of us has this deeply hidden potential either to be a hero or not to be a hero. And we have no way of predicting it and we might never know that about ourselves. It might be that each of us is never in a disaster. I hope not. I hope for all of our sakes we're never in a disaster. So we never know. I, none of us will ever know how we would have acted in Hitler's journey. Would we have joined the resistance, or would we have just played along with Hitler to save ourselves? None of us can know that. 
uh, you'd have to live through that to see for sure. And I find that fascinating. Um, because it's not like it's totally random, right? There's probably something in your character that determines how you're going to act in those situations, but there is no way to determine what that character is until that thing happens. So I find that, that wonderfully interesting. To summarize, all of that, uh, all of that is, is provides reasons for why I think that a purely relational conception of objects is not going to work. And most materialists these days are relationists in that sense. Okay, that brings me to the final point that I worry about with materialism, which is the tendency found especially somewhat in Jane Bennett, but also in Thomas Mayall, who I mentioned, you know, American philosopher, and also in Rain Rowley, uh, who you might not have heard of. He's a well-known intellectual in, in Estonia. He's actually a historian and expert on Asian civilizations, and he's very active in writing against Putin these days during the Ukraine war. He also wrote this book of metaphysics last year called Being in Flux, where he's arguing against me that everything is constantly changing all the time. And again, I would point out that that's not strictly true, right? That certain institutions remain the same. Uh, David Hume would claim that who you are today and who you were at age two are not the same person. I would say that you are. I would say that there are some things that stay the same. There are just a lot of changes in different periods of life. That it is meaningful somehow to talk about the same person going through different ages of life. And I could argue that if I had more time. Um, so here's another problem with saying everything is flux, everything is changing all the time. Like Heraclitus in pre Socratic philosophy, or like Bergson, or like Deleuze, according to some reason, uh, readings. Here's one of the problems with that. If you say ontologically everything is flux, well, that means, all right, um, the Zapatista movement or May 68 in Paris, those are flux because everything is changing. But also the Egyptian dynasties that lasted for thousands of years, that's flux too because everything is flux, right? Everything is changing all the time. So it makes no difference what you look at. There's change. And so if they want to talk about actual change in the concrete sense, like the difference between the Zapatistas and the Egyptian dynasties, that one of them is geared towards change and one is geared towards stability, they need to add a second concept of change on top of their first one. So the first one ends up becoming not that valuable. Also, if everything is changing all the time, why isn't everything just disintegrating in front of our eyes? Why aren't we all just melting into piles of chaos in every instant? So there needs to be something in philosophy called stability theory, which is why do things at least seem to stay the same for a while? And then people say, oh, that's Platonism, that's Platonism. No, it's not. In Plato, things are eternal. I'm not saying things are eternal. I'm just saying things can last a few hundred years, maybe, in the case of trees. Or 2,000 years in the case of an empire like the Egyptians and the Romans. Things can last for a while. They're not constantly disintegrating. So these are some of the problems uh, with new materialism. And it's why object or these are why object oriented ontology are not. Object-oriented ontology is not a case of new materialism or a case that matter at all. But I'm going to make a final point here to really hammer the point home. How long do I have? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Five more minutes. What function does materialism really play in our thinking? The main function that unifies all these forms of materialism. And I would say it is this. I, this, this comes from Mayasu. And I think he is wrong about this. Mayasu, my, my colleague in the speculative realism movement uh, that began in 2007 in Goldsmiths. Um, Mayasu thinks that we can gain mathematical knowledge of reality. He says that Qualities and things are primary qualities if they can be expressed in mathematical terms. And then he adds a caution. He says, I'm not a Pythagorean, right? I'm not like Pythagoras. I don't think the world is made of numbers. I'm just saying that numbers point to reality, point to the qualities in reality. Okay, that sounds like a subtle distinction. What does that really mean? What it really means is that there's something outside our minds that Mayasu calls dead matter. And these mathematical things are somehow stamped into the dead matter. And somehow our mind is able to extract those mathematical realities and bring them into the mind. So basically, we, it's, it's a very traditional model that he has. You're taking the form out of the matter and bringing the form to your mind without distorting it. And that's how we know things. That's how knowledge is possible, according to Nancy. 
My answer is no relativist, he's no skeptic. He thinks if you use mathematics the right way, you can gain true knowledge about the way reality is. And here's why I don't believe that. And why I think there's always going to be a certain defect in any knowledge that we have of anything. First of all, no one has ever seen matter. What is this matter? No one has ever seen matter that is informed. And the Lambda objected to me once, yes, but no one's ever seen forms without matter. Well, actually, we have. We can think of mathematical equations in our mind and they don't have matter in them. Right? A geometric triangle does not necessarily refer to a triangle made out of wood in the real world. In fact, it can't, because real wooden triangles never exactly obey the laws of Euclid. It has to be an ideal triangle in the minds. But the main reason people like Mayasu want there to be matter is because they want absolute knowledge to be possible. So the only way for absolute knowledge to be possible is that if, if there are forms in the world, and we can bring those forms into our mind without damaging them. But you have to be able to say, what's the difference between a perfect knowledge of a dog and a real dog in the world? Because they're obviously different, right? The real dog can bite you. The real dog eats. Your knowledge of a dog never bites you. Your knowledge of a dog never eats. So there's obviously a difference between the, the knowledge of a dog in your mind and the real dog out here. What is that difference? The answer is always going to be, for people like Nasu who are um, mathematically inclined and also materialists, it's going to be, well, the real dog is in matter. And then when you know the dog, you're just taking the forms out of the dog and bringing them into your mind. But since there's no evidence that matter exists, I say that what's really happening there is that there is no matter. That the form of the real dog is different from our form of the knowledge of the dog. And when you extract it and bring it to your mind, you are inevitably translating it. It is a translation. You always lose in translation. You gain sometimes too in translation. Certain books are better in translation than the original language. This is well known. So it's not just loss. But uh, there is a change when you translate a form from one place to the other. When you translate a literal fact into metaphorical language, you get something different. When I see something in the world, it's different from what the actual thing is. Any form of knowledge we have of things in the world is going to be a translation and indeed a distortion of that thing in the world. Now, why, why do people have a hard time believing this? They have a hard time believing this because in some cases, the thing and the form are visually indistinguishable. So I can take a photograph of a real dog, and I can look at it and say, yeah, there's a dog, it's a perfect photograph, that's what the dog looks like. But again, the, the photograph may have the same colors and shapes as the real dog. But the photograph is only two-dimensional, the dog is three-dimensional. The photograph of the dog never eats, it never barks, it never bites. And even if a video of the dog does that, the video of the dog doesn't eat. And so uh, the fact that uh, two things look similar to humans, does not mean that they have the same form, because form is something deeper than the visual look of the thing. And if any of you are architects or interested in architecture, I've talked about this quite a bit in my new book, Architecture and Optics, published at the end of July, about the fact that the term form in, ar in architecture, which is all about form and function, and the distinction between form and function, the word form in architecture is taken too much in the sense of the visual look of the building. But that's not what the form is. The form is something deeper than that. Because a building can have different appearances from different angles, it has a different appearance from the inside, and so forth. So we need to go back to the Aristotelian sense of what was called substantial form, that the form of a thing is hidden, it can never be fully known, it can never be uh, fully explored. This became unpopular because of modern physics, because modern physics wanted to get rid of the occult qualities of alchemy, and wanted to get rid of the mysteries of religion, and so it wanted to reduce objects in the world to only whatever about them could be measured. But there's no such thing as a measurement that exhausts an object. An object by, uh, by nature is a substantial form, and the best we can do is to translate that form. And I was going to end on one final point connected to this, which is that um, some of you have read Kant, probably, to critique the pure reason. And you might remember his critique of the ontological proof for the existence of God. And his analogy is he's talking about the difference between 100 real coins and 100 imaginary coins. And he says there's no real difference between them. Right? That being is not a quality that belongs to things. 
So you can't say that the real coins and the imaginary coins are the same, except that the real coins have being added to them, because being is not a real predicate, he says. Instead, the difference between the real coins and the imaginary coins have to do with the position they have to us. So the real coins are pragmatically constructed in such a way that we can use them to spend things, spend to buy things, and the imaginary coins cannot be spent. I would say that uh, there's a different reason uh, for this, and that reason is that the real coins and the imaginary coins do not have the same form in the first place. Kant is wrong to think that they do. Yes, if, you, if your imagination is powerful enough, you might be able to imagine coins that look very much like the real coins. But again, that's just a similarity in visual appearance. The form is something different from that. The form of the real coins is made of real pieces of metal. The form of the imaginary coins is made of visual pixels in your, in your cerebral cortex. And so the forms are not the same because they're made of different components. So I think this is a good time. Uh, the rise of Newman serialism is, it provides an excellent occasion to rethink the problem of matter and form, which has huge, uh, huge significance not only for the arts and architecture, we can talk more about that in the question period, question period if anyone wants to ask, but also for philosophy more generally. I think we make a lot more progress in philosophy by getting rid of the notion of matter and talking instead about how forms are translated into other forms between different levels of reality. Thank you very much, and I hope it wasn't too fast. Gobierno de México.